G'day guys, we've only got one episode left of Season 1 of Dusk Bowl. If you want to find out what happens after Season 1, please go over to our Indiegogo and help us out. Any support you can give would be absolutely fantastic. We've already got one pledge, let's try and get some more going. I really want to bring Season 2 to life and you can help that happen. The Indiegogo link will be in the description and the pinned comment. And now, on to the video. True. Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous. I have been and am. But why would you say that I am mad? The disease has sharpened my senses. Not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all, there's the sense of, of hearing, acute. I had heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. And I had heard many things in hell. So how then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how, how calmly I could tell you the whole story. It's impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. But once conceived, it haunted me day and night. The object there was none. The passion there was none. I loved the old man. He'd never wronged me. He had never given me insult. And for his gold, I had no desire. So what was it? The eye. I, I think it was the eye. Yeah, yes. It was this. Yeah, the, the eye of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my, my blood ran cold. And so, by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to, to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of, of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. But madmen know nothing. <laughs> but you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than through the whole week before I killed him. And every night, at about, at about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. Then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern. All closed. Closed. But no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. <laughs> you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. 
<laughs> would, would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, cautiously, that the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed. And so it was possible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me. Was it? It was the evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name, in a hearty, healthy tone, and inquiring how he had passed the night. So, you see, he would have been a very, very profound old man to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I've looked upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own <laughs> powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door little by little, and he did not even dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. <laughs> I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly, and as if he was startled. Now, you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness, <laughs> for he kept the shutters fastened for fear of robbers. As because of that, I knew he could not see the opening of the door. I kept pushing on it steadily, steadily. I leaned my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quiet still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh no! It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many at night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it is welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo. The terrors that distracted me, I say, I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt, and I, I pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he'd been lying awake ever since he heard a slight noise. When he had turned in the bed, 
His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He'd been trying to fancy them causeless, but he could not. He'd been saying to himself, It is nothing. It is but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor, or even it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain. All in vain. Because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused it to feel, although neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until a length of a simple, dim light, like a ray, like, like, like the thread of a spider shot out from the crevice, fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all at once a dull a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by an instinct precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you what you mistake for madness is but, but an over-acuteness of the sense? Now, I say, there was to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a, a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder. Every instant, the old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say louder, every moment. Do you mark me? Do you mark me? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house. So strange is this house, it excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet, for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst, and now a new anxiety seized me. The sound will be heard by a neighbour. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leapt onto the bed. He shrieked once, and once only. 
In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. And then... (laughs) I smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The, uh, the old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined his corpse. Yeah, yeah he, he was stone. Stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. It was it was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer. I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse, cut off the head, the arms, and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything was wrong. There was nothing to wash out. No stain of any kind. No blood spot, whatever. I had been too wary for that. (laughs) A tub had caught it all. (laughs) When I made an end of the labours, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight, as the bell sounded the hour. Then there came a, a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbour during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. But I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream, a nightmare. The old man, I mentioned, was out of the country on a trip. I took my visitors all over the house, I paid them, search, search! I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them to rest there from their fatigues. While I, myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. 
how long I felt myself getting pale. I wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but still they sat, and still they chattered. The ringing became more distinct. And became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness until at length I found the noise was not within my ears. No doubt, I now grew very pale. But I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such as the sound of a watch that had been enveloped in cotton. I gasped for a breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about the trifles in a high key and with a violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh, God! What could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore! I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards. But the noise arose over and all continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still, the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they even heard me? Oh! Mighty God, they heard, they suspected, they knew, they were making a mockery of me. This I thought, and this I think, but anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear these hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark, louder, louder and louder. Villains! I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks here, here and here. It is the beating of his hideous heart. Before I head off today, I want to give an absolutely massive thank you to my beautiful, glorious patrons, Lady Nevermore, Skulk Queen, Catherine Gordon, The Curator, and Stephen Stevens.